Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I am the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Generations Family Health Center for hosting today's session, Preoperative Cardiovascular Evaluation with Dr. Robert Lohr. Dr. Lohr uh, did his BA and MD degrees from Northwestern University in Chicago and completed his residency in internal medicine at Hennepin County Medical Center uh, in Minneapolis. After serving as chief resident, he entered practice briefly in Fairmont, Fairmount, Minneapolis, and then went with the Park Nicolette Clinic in Minneapolis for 10 years. During his time at Park Nicolette, he served for four years as chair of the Department of Medicine. In 1993, he accepted a position on staff at the Mayo Clinic. At Mayo, he served as section head for the regional practice and was a member of the Mayo Clinic Practice Committee. Until 2014, he continued to have an active uh, clinical practice with his own patients, as well as resident supervision in both the inpatient and outpatient settings. And we're just so very lucky to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Lohr, when you're ready, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to spend a few minutes with you. We're gonna be talking about what I think is a, what I know is a very common uh, patient scenario that you encounter. And uh, hopefully by the end of the hour, uh, you'll have a better understanding and grasp of how to address some of these issues. Um, uh, don't have any uh, disclosures to make and uh, Kristen talk to you about how you can obtain uh, credit for this talk. Um, our objectives for today are uh, first to understand the basics of a complete pre-op evaluation. We're going to spend the vast majority of our time on the cardiovascular aspects, but we'll talk a little bit about in general uh, pre-op evaluations. Um, you should know when to order testing and when it is not needed, and uh, at least in terms of the CV aspects. Uh, you should become familiar with and be able to apply the accepted cardiac risk evaluation tools and become familiar with and apply the current uh, ACC and AHA guidelines for cardiac evaluation before non-cardiac surgery. ACC is American College of Cardiology and AHA, the American Hospital Association. Uh, by way of introduction, beyond what uh, Kristen told you, uh, I, I, I guess this is a disclosure. I am not a cardiologist. I'm a general internist. Uh, during my time uh, at the Mayo Clinic, I staffed uh, uh, an inpatient and internal medicine consult service, which focuses on preoperative and perioperative medicine. I also staffed the uh, preoperative evaluation clinic, which we call the POE. Uh, which was a very busy, busy operation. We uh, generally saw between 40 and 60 patients every day. And I've had the opportunity to give a few talks like this uh, around the country. So let's start with, you know, why do we do pre-op exams? Uh, first of all, I want to very clearly state that you're not doing a pre-op exam to, quote, clear the patient for surgery, even though you're always asked to do that please clear this patient for their shoulder surgery or whatever it happens to be. You should be doing a, an evaluation of the pa patient's current medical status. You should be making recommendations concerning that evaluation, uh, identifying and managing risk factors, both cardiac, which is the majority of the issues, uh, but other medical uh, concerns as well. And, uh, uh, make suggestions for management of these over the entire perioperative period and provide a clinical risk profile. And you need to be thinking of the audience, which is, of course, the patient, but also the anesthesiology team and the surgeon. So you're asking yourself, well, if I can't say at the end of my note the patient's cleared to proceed, what am I supposed to say? Uh, and the reason you shouldn't say clearance is that if you say the patient is cleared to go good to go no matter what, and something doesn't go well, you're potentially liable, even though uh, you may have cleared them only for specific things, but you know a good, good attorney will see through that in a hurry. So it's better to say, to you know, put your evaluation in the context of this paragraph that uh, I evaluated the patient and their medical status is uh, maximized and stable for the plan procedure with the following recommendations. So and when you do any pre-op evaluation, there are essentially six areas to talk about or to consider. And we're going to spend our time today on the cardiac issues, 
there may be pulmonary issues and pulmonary problems are actually the most common type of post-operative complications. Uh, many patients are diabetic. And so you have to make recommendations about what they should be doing. Uh, certainly uh, the day of surgery, maybe a few days before surgery, usually the management of the diabetes post-op, unless you're seeing the patient in the hospital, uh, would be done by the surgical team, uh, or they may consult someone to do it as well. Many, many patients are anticoagulated now. And so the question comes up, do we need to stop the anticoagulation? If we do, when? When do we restart it? Um, what factors play into this? Uh, if they're on warfarin, uh, is there concern about or need to do bridging, uh, particularly if they're at a very high risk, they've had a history of a stroke, something like that. So those issues need to be addressed. Their medications should be addressed. What should be taken? What should not be taken? Uh, and then the other refers to other serious medical issues that may impact the perioperative uh, care. Uh, decompensated liver disease, and by that I mean decompensated cirrhosis, someone with uh, recurrent ascites, encephalopathy, uh, uh, coagulopathy, and, and the like. Uh, renal failure, uh, always an issue with medication management. And thyroid disease refers mainly to hyperthyroidism, which is not controlled. Every patient should have their anesthetic history inquired about. Uh, they need to, you need to ask them about bleeding and clotting history, including their family history, and then make sure that you understand their alcohol, tobacco consumption, if they've been using steroids recently, other drug use, and chronic pain medication, uh, in particular buprenorphine, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's start with a case, and we're going to quick, quickly walk through this case. And then the rest of our time will be uh, spent in uh, presenting to you the guidelines and the recommendations of why uh, we managed the case the way we did. So this is, I think, a pretty typical case that you might see. A 76-year-old male who's scheduled for an elective TKA total knee arthroplasty. Now, he has a history of coronary artery disease treated medically, so no stents and no uh, surgery. Uh, he is not able to perform four METs, and we will talk about what four METs is. Uh, as you ask them, the four METs essentially is uh, walking up a flight of stairs or up a hill for a block or two. And he isn't able to do that because of his knee pain. But he does say that he can do water aerobics and, and does that without limitation or symptoms. Uh, he's taking um, a reasonable regimen for his underlying conditions at good doses, metoprolol, aspirin, atorvastatin, lisinopril. Uh, his exam is quite benign, a, a soft systolic murmur, but nothing too worrisome. Uh, and so you advise the following, and your choices are a cardiogram and chest x-ray, as well as electrolytes, uh, a dubutamine stress echo with a cardiology consultation to follow. Uh, a cardiogram, electrolytes, continue his medicines, except uh, you'll note that the lisinopril is not included here. Uh, the fourth is just go ahead and do coronary angiography. And lastly, a cardiogram, electrolytes, uh, excuse me, continue the medications and do a, a DSC pre-op to see if there are other indications for further evaluation. So we can't... Uh, uh, do this by voting or anything on the current platform we have. But I want you to think about this just for a second or two. And I'll tell you that the best answer is actually number three. Uh, the cardiogram, the lights, and continuing the, medi the medications, excluding the lisinopril. So number one, uh, we do want a cardiogram. Now, having said that, if you have access to a, an ECG that's even up to a year old, if as long as the patient is, is uh, clinically stable, you don't need to repeat it. Uh, if they are not clinically stable, you certainly would. And if you don't have access to it, you would. Uh, the patient had no pulmonary symptoms and no pulmonary history. You don't need a chest x-ray. Uh, you should do the electrolytes mainly because of the use of lisinopril and because the patient's going to be getting IV fluid and, and there'll be some fluid shifts. You do not need a stress echo or a cardiology consultation, and we'll be talking about why that is. Number three, we said, is the best answer. You certainly don't need to go right to coronary angiography. And again, number five, you don't need 
uh, the cardiology follow-up. So how did we get to that answer? Well, we're going to walk through the uh, most recent ACC AHA guidelines. Uh, and it's a long algorithm and I, you know, putting algorithms up on slides is fraught with problems. So I've basically reproduced the algorithm in a series of slides. So we're gonna go through it step by step. So the first question that you're asked in this uh, algorithm is, is the surgery emergent? Now, in your clinical setting, in your office setting, you rarely encounter this. You might, but you rarely encounter this there. It's usually in the emergency room. And uh, those patients are uh, you know, either sent to the OR or not. But if it is truly an emergency, um, you don't do any pre-op evaluation. They have to go to the operating room and you try and pick up the pieces post-operatively. Now, if it's not an emergency, you proceed to step two. But before we do that, let's talk about what is an emergency. So this is a situation where you have life or limb threatened if the patient is not in the operating room within six hours. So uh, this would be a ruptured aortic aneurysm, uh, a perforated abdominal viscous in a patient who's already septic from it. Someone who really would die potentially within a matter of hours or a short period of time if the surgical question is not immediately addressed. An urgent operation is one where life or limb is threatened if the patient's not in the OR between six and 24 hours. Now, I think the best example of this is a hip fracture. And you're thinking to yourself, well, a hip fracture doesn't have to be repaired that quickly, but it actually does. Most of the people who break their hips are elderly, most of them uh, 80 or over. And if you look at the morbidity and the mortality uh, for patients with hip fractures, especially over 80, if they are not repaired in 24 to 36 hours or so, then uh, the mortality goes way up. Uh, there is a good deal of delirium. There are pulmonary emboli and other blood clots. There sometimes are MIs. Uh, you want to get these patients in the OR, usually within a day or so. Time-sensitive operations with those that are those that can be delayed, you know, a matter of weeks. So a good example of this would be a new diagnosis of, uh, we'll say, a, a renal cell cancer. You don't have to operate tomorrow. You don't want to wait forever, though. So this would fall into that category. Elective procedures are truly elective. They can wait forever. I mean, there's a reason to do the surgery, but uh, you don't have to do it right away. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to talk about risk and what's called MACE as well, or define these for you. So a risk of major adverse cardiac event or death, and that's abbreviated as MACE, major adverse cardiac event, low risk is considered less than 1%. So this is a fairly high bar. I mean, that isn't a very high percentage. And if the MACE is over 1%, it is considered elevated risk. So our patient that you're seeing is not an emergent patient, so we're going to go on to step two. And that is to determine, and this is an easy one to determine, are there any active cardiac conditions? And I call these showstoppers because they are. Uh, and these are quite obvious. Someone walks in and you're doing a pre-op and they have unstable angina, new angina. They just had an MI a week ago or two weeks ago. Uh, decompensated heart failure, or it could be worsening or new heart failure. Significant arrhythmias, most of the time in the outpatient setting, this is a supraventricular arrhythmia with an elevated rate. So atrial fibrillation with uh, a rapid ventricular response at rest. And then severe valvular disease. And primarily here, we're talking about aortic stenosis. Uh, it can be mitral stenosis, or it could be very severe mitral regurge, but usually then the symptoms are heart failure. Now, the reason that these are showstoppers are that the patient really can't go to the OR until whatever this, whatever these issues are, are fully addressed and, and mitigated. So this is the time when you pick up the phone and call the surgeon. And, and I want to repeat that. You pick up the phone and call the surgeon. You don't text them. You don't send them an email. You don't leave them a message at their office. You need to talk to the surgeon. Now, if they're operating, you need to uh, make sure that the operating room nurse knows what this is about because the surgeon needs to know to get the schedule adjusted, to get their schedule adjusted, and also to contact the patient uh, from their standpoint uh, once the cardiac issues are, are addressed.
Um, the valvular heart disease, I want to spend a little bit more time on. So if you clinically suspect moderate or greater degrees of uh, AS or regurgitation uh, or a change in clinical status, you need to get an echocardiogram and quantify what's going on. And as from the last slide, as you recall, the definition of severe AS uh, from an echo standpoint is a gradient across the valve of greater than 40 millimeters or a valve area of less than one centimeter squared. So if the patient meets standards, uh, the standard indications for valvular intervention on the basis of symptoms and or severity of the uh, echo findings, then the valve needs to be repaired before the surgery that you're planning on doing. Um, so what this means is that if you have a patient that uh, you have echo data and you know they have severe AS, uh, and especially if they're symptomatic, that needs to be addressed first. And again, you have to call the surgeon and talk to them about this. Um, if you don't have echo data, then you need to make the determination based on your physical findings. Now, if the patient's symptomatic, that's very helpful because symptomatic AS is generally a bad sign. And the symptoms are heart failure, angina, and syncope, typically. Uh, but they may not be symptomatic, and so you have to rely on your physical exam findings. Now, the intensity of the murmur is not does not correlate with the severity of the stenosis. A very, very soft AS murmur may be very, very severe because the heart often has failed at that point, and there's very little blood crossing the valve when syst uh, systole occurs. Um, the main things you have to listen for is the uh, where the crescendo decrescendo murmur peaks. Normally, AS would be a, a sharp up and a sharp down, kind of a mid-peaking uh, murmur. In severe AS, it is a late-peaking murmur. It's a more gradual increase and then a drop-off that almost runs into uh, S2. So a late-peaking murmur is one sign. And then the other is when you check the carotid pulse and you have to time it while you're listening to the heart. Uh, normally you hear S1 and you almost immediately feel a, an uptick, a stroke. Uh, in severe AS, you have what's called pulsus tardis and, and uh, parvus. It's late and it's low. So you hear S1 and you don't immediately feel the uptick. It's later and it's, it's not as strong. So if you have those findings and the late peaking murmur, you should get an echo. So uh, we don't have any showstoppers. Uh, if there are no active cardiac conditions and we feel that the MACE is less than 1%, and we'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute. If the surgery is low risk, then you're done and the patient can go to the OR. If it is not low risk, then you need to assess their underlying risk factors and their functional capacity. So what are low risk procedures? Uh, endoscopies, derm, cataract surgery. In fact, we don't, uh, at Mayo Clinic, we do not even do pre-op exams for cataract surgery uh, for any patients, no matter what their past uh, history is. Anesthesia, we'll talk to the patient briefly ahead of time, but cataract surgery is uh, with local anesthetic, about 20 or 30 minutes, there's essentially no blood loss, uh, and there's not much that can go wrong from a cardiac standpoint. Breast surgery is considered low risk. Ambulatory surgery and dental procedures, all low risk. So these patients don't need further evaluation if it's in a low risk uh, category. <clears throat> Intermediate risk, and these are patients that you would commonly see, would be intraperitoneal intrathoracic surgery, carotid endarterectomy, CEA, head and neck orthopedic prostate urologic procedures. So run-of-the-mill surgeries. High risk are uh, major vascular surgery, including peripheral vascular, but it's mostly supra-inguinal, pulmonary and liver transplants, and pneumonectomy. Now the high risk patients, I suspect you're not going to necessarily see for pre-op evals. Uh, I would not normally see those patients either because they are being followed by vascular medicine or cardiology or pulmonary or a transplant team, and they would do the whatever pre-op evaluation need be done. But certainly the low risk and intermediate risk patients you will see. So we're going to assess their functional capacity, and this is really a key, key thing to know about. We talked about four METs 
climbing a flight of, st flight of stairs, walking a block or two. 10 Mets is, you know, strenuous sports, swimming, singles, tennis, basketball, that sort of thing. There is very good evidence, though, that if you can do four Mets, at least four Mets, the patient's functional capacity, no matter what their history is, should allow them to proceed. There's good levels of evidence for this. If you can't do four Mets, you have to proceed with some further evaluation. Now, you can ask the patient about climbing hills and so forth, and you may feel very comfortable with it. If the patient looks really fit and they're active and you're, you know, you're, you're comfortable with that, you can say, okay, you can do four Mets. But many times, you know, patients say, well, I can climb a flight of stairs, but it takes me, you know, a long time and I don't go up hills and so forth. And you just don't know what to, uh, what to make of that. So in 1989, the DASI, which is the Duke Activity uh, Score and Activity Status Index was developed and it's been modified a few times, but basically it objectifies the functional status questions. Uh, the higher the score, the better. 58 point something is, is the highest you can get, but anything over 34 suggests a low risk. Um, and I think this is a very useful thing to do. I'm not going to, these are the questions. I'm not going to run through them. You can access this by just Googling it. Uh, it's not on MedCalc, but it is available uh, from a Google standpoint. Um, and actually, if you're doing pre a pre-op exam and you know the patient has some cardiac history or not, uh, you can have your nurse or your clinical assistant ask them these questions ahead of time and just give you the results or the total number so that you know where you stand with their functional capacity. But this obviously adds some objectivity and uh, makes the patient think about what they're doing a little bit more so that you can make a better assessment. And I think this is a very good thing to use. So next step. We looked at their functional capacity. We want to know if there are clinical risk factors, uh, anything that would cause the MACE to go up. So these are pretty self-evident. Uh, history of ischemic heart disease, history of compensated heart failure, history of stroke, and that includes TIA, uh, history of cerebrovascular disease, and uh, history of diabetes and renal insufficiency. Now, it turns out that these elements, these five things, plus one more that we'll see, are the components of the most widely used cardiac risk uh, indicator uh, that is used. And that is the Revised Cardiac Risk Index, the RCRI. Been around a long time, 1999, been well validated, and it predicts major cardiac events, MI, pulmonary edema, VFib, cardiac arrest, complete heart block, uh, quite well. It underestimates risk in patients who are undergoing vascular surgery. And so there are, there's another tool that we'll talk about in just a few minutes that uh, you can use to mitigate that. But the, the things that give you points on the RCRI, and each of these bullets is equal to one point, a uh, high risk procedure. Now they include intraperitoneal and intrathoracic procedures as high risk, whereas the AHA guideline did not and then supraingular inguinal <laughs> vascular uh, operations are high risk. Uh, uh, again, a history of uh, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, stroke, TIA, diabetes treated with insulin and a pre-op creatinine of two or greater, um, which usually translates to a GFR of 30 or less. So each of those gives you one point, and this is how the points stack up. Uh, no points, you have a 0.4 risk of MACE, 1.9%. And then anything above that, your MACE goes over 1%. So uh, greater than one point, two or more on the RCRI puts you in a high risk category. And again, this is, this is quick and easy. Um, you could have your assistant help with this, but it probably is better to have you asking these questions or going through the history and the chart and delineating some of the answers. Now, uh, this is another uh, risk calculator that was developed by the American College of Surgeons and it's called, NISQIP stands for National Surgical Quality Improvement Project. And they actually have a database with millions of patients. And I'm going to take, we're going to open this and I'll walk you through it uh, briefly. 
uh, it's going to give you a very broad picture of the cardiac and other risks for this patient. And it can be very helpful when you're assessing these patients. So we'll see if we can get this to open. Now they're gonna ask me if I'm a robot at least once, if not twice. Uh, but it looks like I'm going to get by this time <laughs> without too much problem. Um, first of all, they want you to put the procedure in. Uh, and that's good because different procedures have different risks. So we're going to put uh, total knee. Um, and we're going to say it's a revision arthroplasty. And the reason we're doing the revision is that the, it's infected. Uh, they always want to know if there are other options, and you generally can say no. And then you do have to plug in a fair amount of data, but it's easily obtained data. And we're going to create a patient here. Um, we're going to say that they're 85. Uh, female, they are not independent. They're partially dependent. It is not an emergency, but we know the hip is infected. They are going to ask you to fill in the ASA class. This is American Society of Anesthesiology classification. This has been used by anesthesia since the 1950s, and it correlates very well with anesthetic complications. It's pretty easy to do, and fortunately, they tell you what to put in here. So uh, class one is a healthy patient. Mild systemic disease would be controlled hypertension or controlled asthma. Uh, severe systemic disease would be those uncontrolled or maybe angina with exertion. Uh, severe systemic disease, constant threat to life would be unstable angina, uh, diabetes out of control, COPD, oxygen dependent, that sort of thing. And then moribund, there's actually a sick class six, which is for organ uh, harvesting. So we're going to say that our patient has severe systemic disease. Uh, they have not been on steroids. They don't have liver disease, there's no ascites, but we are saying that they were pretty sick with this infection and they were septic. They're not this moment. Not on a ventilator, they don't have disseminated cancer. We'll give the patient some diabetes and we'll give them some hypertension and we'll give them a little dyspnea. Uh, no COPD, they're not dialyzing, they're not in renal failure. And we're going to give this patient uh, a very short stature and a very high weight to complicate life. Okay. Now, they, if your patient's elderly, they will also ask you some geriatric questions, which I think are useful to have as well. So did they use a mobility aid? Yes. Uh, did they come from home? No. Uh, have they had a fall, a fall history? We'll say yes. Is there some dementia? We'll say yes. Uh, were they in hospice? No. And their surrogate did sign the consent. So this, uh, we have to make sure we're not a robot again. Uh, this is what you come up with. And this can be printed off and give it to the patient or use it however you wish. But it gives you a very, very broad picture of what potentially could happen with this patient. So we have serious complications, any complications, the bar is the average, the red, the black bar, the red bar is where the patient is. So there is some higher risk here, pneumonia, cardiac complications, surgical uh, site infection, UTI, DVT, renal failure, readmission, pretty high, return to the OR, death, uh, about 12%, 13%. Discharge to a nursing home, very high, 81%. Well, we said they're already septic. And then these are the uh, geriatric questions. A very high risk of post-op delirium. Some functional decline is not going to get worse necessarily. Maybe have mobility problems. So these are issues that you can review. You may not want to discuss all these with the patient, but they're useful for you to make some decisions. I think something like the postoperative delirium risk, which obviously is very high in this patient, would be something you'd want to discuss with the patient and their family so that when they are having trouble with confusion post-op, which they probably will, uh, the family's a little bit prepared for that and the request from the nursing service for the family to help in managing that. So this is a very, very useful tool. Okay. 
Now, let's get out of this if we can. Uh, here we go. Okay. Now, uh, I mentioned that the RCRI has some drawbacks, and this is the tool that you might consider using as an alternative. It's the American Hospital, American University Hospital of Beirut, uh, has two. Has refers to H is heart disease, A is age and anemia, S is the type of surgery. So heart disease is ischemic heart disease or any symptoms of heart disease. Each of these gets one point. Age over 75 and anemia, hemoglobin less than 12, again, one point each. And emergency surgery and vascular surgery will give you a point as well. Okay. And this is how the points come out. Um, if there are no points, it's 0 0.3 risk, one point, you're already above 1% risk, and so a higher risk, like MACE is higher risk, and it goes up from there. Now, I whether you use the RCRI or this is, is your call. They're both very easy to use. Again, your nurse or clinical assistant could probably ask these questions and have this filled out for you before you even see the patient. Uh, but this, again, has been well validated. And, and this was actually validated with the NISQIB database, which, as I mentioned, is, is actually millions of patients. So it's a very useful and, and good tool to have. Okay, so we've... we've We've done the evaluation. Uh, their MACE is greater than one, and we can't assess their functional capacity. So what do we do next? Um, we should consider further testing if the results are going to impact the decision to proceed, or if you would actually proceed with some revascularization uh, or consider angiography. It's not recommended for just routine revascularization for every patient who has coronary artery disease. And again, the functional capacity feeds into that decision. What tests should you do? Well, this may be dictated by what you have available. Um, your uh, cardiologist may, may or may not choose what, what I have used and what we use uh, here, uh, but there would be some sort of a functional test, an exercise test that can be done without the patient uh, actually walking or riding a bicycle. So some chemical sort of test. We have used the dobutamine stress echo uh, and that's done by doing a standard echo at rest, <clears throat> then giving the patient dobutamine and then repeating it. And you can actually see wall motion abnormalities developed as the pulse rate goes up. You can get a, you know, a minimum pulse rate that you want or a maximum pulse rate rather that you want to avoid. Uh, and anesthesia can use that information. So if the patient gets into trouble at a pulse of, we'll just say 130, that's where we need to keep the patient below. If they get into trouble with a pulse of 80 or 90, it's hard to keep it below that. And there may be need to do some further intervention. But the decision always needs to be based on if the outcome will make some meaningful recommendations for anesthesia and the surgeon. Now, I wanna tell you just in one slide about the Canadian guidelines, which are distinctly different. These were developed in 2017. Uh, they do not recommend any stress testing for any patient cardiac or otherwise. Uh, they say for patients, any patient over 65 or a younger patient, 45 to 64, with a history of heart, heart disease, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, or if they have an RCRI score of greater than one, that those patients should have a BNP, uh, a B-natriuretic peptide test. If that's elevated, then they should be monitored post-op with ECGs and troponins, and uh, they suggest co-management with a medical uh, specialist, either anesthesia, critical care, or cardiology, or internal medicine. So this is a distinct departure from the American guidelines where we would recommend some further stress testing, basically, or the US uh, American Heart Association would recommend that. Um, but it, 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 this has worked in Canada. They, they're 
concerned about the lack of uh, positive effect of doing stress testing and intervening on patients that are at high risk. They're just saying, go ahead, go to the OR <clears throat> and monitor them carefully. And if uh, something bad happens, you're, you're ready for it. So what should you do? Uh, assuming you're following the AHA guidelines, I think the best way to approach this is to take the surgical question out of the equation. So just say you're not seeing this patient for a pre-op exam, but you're just seeing them for a general medical exam, a GME. And they come in and they say, well, you know, I've been feeling good, but I, I can't walk up a hill anymore uh, because I get this tightness in my chest. Um, would you test that patient and, and uh, put them on a treadmill or do something to evaluate it further? I think the answer is yes. So if the answer is yes in that setting, then it should be yes in the pre-op setting as well. If the answer is no, you probably can go to the OR. Okay, a few more slides just about some specific things, beta blockers. Historically, beta blockers were encouraged to be given um, preoperatively. I hope my dog is not interfering with what I'm saying here. Uh, she is barking. Um, however, the trial that uh, suggested that was actually discredited and there was some, some fraudulent data in it. And then the POISE trial came along in 2008 and they suggested that beta blockers were actually harmful. But that trial was criticized because of the way they did it. They gave 200 milligrams of metoprolol to beta blocker naive patients pre-op and then another 200 about six hours post-op. And not surprisingly, they had a fair amount of bradycardia and hyper hypotension and more strokes and more heart, uh, heart attacks than in the control group. Um, and then there have been some retrospective studies that say even continuing beta blockers is harmful, but that has not been test tested in a prospective manner. So the current recommendations are that if the patient's on a beta blocker, you should continue it, same dose. Uh, if the patient's not on a beta blocker and there are lots of risk factors, three or more RCRI risk factors, consider starting it before the surgery. If there's a long-term indication, but no RCR, RCR, I'm sorry, RCRI risk factors, uh, starting a beta blocker is really of uncertain value. If you do start, you should not do it right before surgery. Uh, if you uh, if you really feel compared to start uh, compelled to start a beta blocker, it should be a week or so pre-op, and then you should see the patient back. Make sure they're not in heart failure, they're not bradycardic, they're not hypotensive, they're tolerating the medicine well. And uh, if that's the case, then they should be able to proceed. But there are problems uh, potentially starting right the day before surgery and then going to the OR because you don't know exactly how they're going to respond. Hypertension, it's a pretty low bar here. Uh, you're good to go as long as it's less than 180 over 110. Uh, anesthesia is generally pretty happy with higher blood pressure. Uh, patients in general, and we'll talk about medications at the very end, but they should be instructed to take their antihypertensives the day of surgery. Now, there are two exceptions, uh, ACEs and ARBs and diuretics. The diuretics are mainly because of the fluid shifts that occur uh, in the OR and, and immediately after, uh, and uh, the fact that they're getting a lot of IV fluid too. The ACEs and ARBs, uh, there is some data that they can result in a pretty significant systolic drop in blood pressure with induction of anesthesia. So uh, if the patient has a baseline blood pressure, you know, really well controlled, 110, 120, I would definitely hold the ACE, and ARB, ACE or ARB. If it's not as well controlled, 150, 160 systolic, you probably could give it because that kind of a drop isn't going to get you into too much trouble. Uh, statins uh, certainly can be continued. Starting is reasonable, at least with vascular surgery. Uh, I don't generally start a statin, but if the patient you know, has heart disease and is not on one, uh, it would be reasonable to do really at any point, pre, peri, or postoperatively. Alpha-2 agonists are not indicated. You don't have to worry about those. Many patients, as you know, are on antiplatelet drugs for a variety of reasons. So in the 2014 guidelines, this was the recommendation, but then the AHA promptly revised that uh, to the 26 uh, in 2016. So I'm going to walk you through this very briefly. This is the patient who has undergone a PCI uh, 
percutaneous cardiac intervention and is going undergoing non-cardiac surgery. So if they have a bare metal stent and they're treated with dual active platelet therapy, so aspirin plus clopidogrel or ticagrelor or something, uh, if it's within 30 days, don't operate. Over 30 days, you can operate. If it's a drug eluding stent, which is the vast majority of the time, if it's within three months, uh, you should not operate. If it's three to six months, proceed if you have to. And if it's over six months, you can proceed. Now, in these settings, when they normally would be on dual therapy, uh, all of them, if you are going to proceed to the OR, uh, you should stop the clopidogrel uh, and usually about a week ahead. <clears throat> but you don't necessarily have to stop the aspirin. Most surgeons and most procedures can be done with the patient taking a baby aspirin quite safely. Uh, there are two exceptions, uh, craniotomies and spine surgery. And the reason is if there is bleeding, that's quite catastrophic and, and very difficult to control. Okay, what about surveillance post-op? Uh, the American guidelines don't recommend it unless the patient's symptomatic, basically. Uh, and as we talked about, the Canadian guidelines differ from that. What about COVID? Uh, and this is not the easiest slide to see, so I'm again going to walk you through this very briefly. Uh, you have many patients uh, who have had COVID, and uh, they may be coming in now for surgery. So <clears throat> the left side is the time from the COVID diagnosis. The right side is, is the risk of major adverse cardiac events, low and elevated. <clears throat> so if the patient is asymptomatic and had uh, or mild or moderate COVID, so these are outpatients basically, and it's less than seven weeks since the diagnosis, you would delay in all circumstances. If it's over seven weeks uh, and it's low risk of MACE, <clears throat> you can proceed. Uh, you can proceed with some caution uh, if it's elevated risk. Now, if they've had severe disease, so this is the patient in the ICU, ventilated and so forth, less than seven weeks, everybody is delayed. Over seven weeks, if they're still having symptoms, you should delay. Over seven weeks with resolution of symptoms, low risk, proceed high risk again with caution or only if you really have to. So seven weeks is, is really the key Thing here and then determining if they are high or low risk. Now that said, uh, in March of this year, a study came out from the UK and of course they have their National Health Service and a uh, huge database. And they looked at the timing of surgery post COVID from 2018 to 2022. And they found that not that many, I mean, a small percentage of procedures were actually conducted in less than seven weeks after the COVID infection, but 3% of a large number is a pretty large number. After uh, wide availability of vaccines occurred, the mortality for surgery was 1.1%, and this is all surgeries, uh, within if the surgery was done within two weeks, and 0.3% if within four weeks. So what this suggests is that in the asymptomatic patients, if surgery is urgent, uh, and I suggested like a new cancer diagnosis, it may be safe to perform in less than seven weeks, or at least to consider doing that. Every patient you see, cardiac underlying conditions or not, uh, for a pre-op exam should be checked for OSA. And again, this is something that you can have your assistant do. Uh, they can go through a, a stop bang and show you the answer. Unrecognized uh, or untreated uh, OSA post-op causes mortality and certainly increases morbidities as well. Um, if you're, if you have a patient that has severe, uh, C uh, severe OSA, uh, and you can't do anything about it immediately pre-op, uh, you might consider suggesting ICU monitoring or even moving the patient from an outpatient to an inpatient setting. Most sophisticated anesthesia practices will actually do some testing uh, in the post-operative area to see if the patient's adequately breathing before they send them to the floor versus the ICU. Last slide is on meds in general. 
Uh, we talked about blood pressure medicines. Again, the diuretics you may hold and the ACEs and ARBs you would hold for some patients, at least uh, the day of surgery. Uh, for That's for hypertensive patients. For diabetic patients, PO meds should be held. So metformin, the sulfonyl ureas, uh, any PO med that they're taking should be held. If they're on ultra long acting insulin, the uh, Lantus, you can give that in its full dose. Now the caveat is, uh, I think it's good to ask the patient uh, what their first morning sugar is. If it's 90, I would probably cut the dose of, of Lantus just a little bit, maybe you know by a quarter or a half. If it's 140 or 50, go ahead and give the whole dose. If the patient's using intermediate acting insulin, uh, NPH, uh, you should cut the dose by 50%. If they are taking a, an SGLT2 inhibitor, that should be held for three to four days pre-op. And the reason for this is that these patients can develop a uh, normal glycemic uh, ketoacidosis, and particularly in the setting of them not eating uh, NPO and then the surgery and so forth. So you want to have these drugs out of the system. Their diabetes can be managed otherwise uh, perioperatively. If they're taking a GLP-1 inhibitor, a glucagon, uh, not inhibitor, but a receptor agonist, a glucagon agonist, that should be held the day of surgery. Or if they're getting a weekly injection, they shouldn't get it the week of surgery. And the reason for this is the reason that these drugs are effective in weight loss. They cause gastric retention and the stomach doesn't empty. But if you're going to the operating room and the stomach's not empty, there's a higher risk of aspiration, and that has been uh, documented now. Uh, we talked about beta blockers. Uh, other cardiac meds should be continued. Certainly, anticonvulsants should be continued in order to have the patient have a seizure in the, when they wake up. Pain meds should be continued. Now, the main thing here is to note if the patient's on buprenorphine. Uh, which is a partial opioid agonist. Uh, it requires pain control. Post-op requires very high doses of uh, oxycodone or morphine or whatever they're using post-op to overcome the effects of the buprenorphine. So it's, it's just useful to note that so that the people taking care of the patient post-op can make adjustments. You can stop the buprenorphine ahead of the surgery, but then you have troubles with withdrawal, uh, uncontrolled pain, and sometimes problems with uh, recidivism in terms of drug uh, use. Parkinson meds should be continued. You don't want, you know, the patient's NPO, then they don't eat after the surgery, and then it's time to get up and they can't move. So you want to continue those. MAO, MAO inhibitors can be given. And generally, inhalers should be given uh, as they are uh, ahead of time. If patients are on a PRN albuterol inhaler, an asthmatic, for example, uh, I usually have them take that even if their breathing is just fine the morning of surgery, because there can be some bronchoconstriction uh, with the induction of anesthesia. And I believe that is the last slide. I'm happy to take questions. I think we have. Uh, 10 or 15 minutes here. Yep. So I'm going to stop the share and go here and we'll take some questions. All right, we have some questions and I do see a hand raise, but um, just a reminder, if you do have a question, put it into the Q&A box or use the raise hand feature and I will go in order. Um, I think this is part comment. So we have surgery surg surg centers that insist for cataracts even after sending them the ACC guidelines, they are telling us it is their insurance requirements. Uh, can, I, can you repeat it? Yeah. <laughs> they're insisting on a what? And cataracts? Oh, they're, they're insisting on having a pre-op with cataracts. Um, I, I would view this as an opportunity to uh, educate them. <laughs> uh, there, again, is really no reason to be doing a full pre-op exam uh, for car for cataract surgery, uh, for pretty much any patient. There are very, very few exceptions that I can come up with. Uh, their insurance uh, requirements and liability requirements uh, are basically out of date. And I think it would, you know, you're going to have to do the pre-op exam, but if there is an opportunity to educate the referring group 
or the referring surgery, surgery, surgery center, uh, this would be the time to bring it up. And just a follow up that this um, uh, physician did send the guidelines and they replied that they needed it. And they did what? Uh, they replied that they did need it. So yeah, I, I understand that. But I, I think it, it's more than just sending the guidelines. It may be a conversation. And, and it may have to be a conversation from, you know, maybe not just you, but maybe your medical director and your clinical administrator and so forth. It's it's a huge waste of, of time, effort, money. Uh, your schedules are extremely full. You don't need to be doing, you know, seeing patients that don't need to be seen. All right. Dr. Levin has his hand raised. I've given you the permission to unmute yourself so you can talk, Dr. Levin. Great talk. Thank you. I was concerned <clears throat> that um, you didn't uh, speak very much about liver disease. There's a concept of acute on chronic liver disease, which is non cirrhotic and is commonly provoked um, postoperatively if it's not, if you're not aware of it. Uh, hepatologists don't get along very well with each other in the sand pile, so that there are like some of your guidelines are different. So we have European, American, and Asian guidelines, and they're really quite different. Um, I would guess that the or European are the best because they're the most precise and they have the most data. But I think you have to be very careful. And one thing you can do, if there's any question, is check uh, a, um, a, a NAS score because if it's 18 or over, I, I would really avoid elective surgery because the chance of acute on chronic liver disease is very high. And it, you don't need cirrhosis for this. Um, you can have a, you know, a variety of liver disease. And since liver disease is now very, very common, probably up to 30% of the world's population, there are 8 billion people, at least a billion have fatty liver. Now, half those people with fatty liver are not clinically ill, but a lot of them are, and, and it's not unheard of. So I, I think it'd be great if in clearance, people begin to consider the issues with liver disease again. Getting in, uh, yeah, you, know, you check, um, you know, the bilirubin, creatinine, um, the INR. <laughs> INR, and the sodium, and you know, right. and if it's more than eighteen, um, I, I would really be reluctant. Those patients uh, often go into liver failure afterward. Yeah, I, I, you're exactly correct, Doctor Levin. Um, and this talk obviously isn't about liver disease, but I can tell you that. I personally find patients with liver disease who have decompensation post-op to be some of the most difficult patients to manage. Absolutely, very, very hard. Um, and you're correct. I think if there's a history of liver disease and between uh, fatty liver and hepatitis C, it's very, very common, as you point out, uh, doing the MELD score. And for that, you, 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 know, you plug in the, as you said, the bilirubin, the INR, the creatinine, and a sodium <clears throat> into the med calc thing on your phone. And actually, I use a number 14 rather than 18 uh, to worry about them. Uh, patients who are 18 actually should probably be considered for liver transplant before they have the surgery. Patients that are already decompensated, again, the uh, patient who's got a lot of ascites, has had GI bleeding, they're encephalopathic, all of that gets worse postoperatively. So if they have large ascites, you need to do a pre-op paracentesis. Uh, if they have coagulopathy, you need to correct that as best you can, uh, which may mean platelet transfusions pre-op. It may mean vitamin K, uh, which may or may not be helpful. It might mean fresh frozen plasma. When they drop their blood pressure post-op, you can't just dump in fluids because it goes into their belly. You have to use more albumin, uh, that sort of thing. And it's just, they're very, very hard to manage. So I think your point's very, very well taken. And, and the, and once they get pushed over the edge, they don't recover very much. We use uh, the 18, for instance, for, for um, considering a, a TIPS. Mm -hmm. Because after that, they tend to decompensate. And, and again, part of the issue can be heart failure. If they have right heart failure, liver tests become very abnormal. Mm -hmm. Those people recover nicely if you take care of the heart failure. If you have ischemic heart disease and they have liver disease, they don't do well. Yeah. So, yeah. But Especially... I think you have to consider it's so common in our population now um, that you, you folks are really, or people who, who do this, do the screening, have to be aware of it and, and uh, keep that in, in the equation. 
Yep, yep. I, well, anyway, it's a great talk. I thought it was absolutely terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you please comment on preoperative antibiotic needs? Preoperative antibiotics? Yes. Um, typically, these are not ordered by uh, whoever is doing the, by you, by whoever is doing the pre-op exam. Uh, the surgeons have guidelines about what should be given uh, preoperatively, and it's generally speaking uh, a gram of, of uh ANSEF uh, preoperatively, uh, the, which does decrease the risk of uh, skin and soft tissue infections post-op. Uh, the, the problem that has in the past been uh, that people have run into is that they continue it too long. So it's generally you know one dose, uh, sometimes two, but uh, if it's a very prolonged procedure, they will give two doses. But if it's, if it's a routine procedure, they'll just give one dose. But it's not something that you necessarily have to worry about. It's just generally speaking, the surgeons themselves, the surgical team will manage that uh, on, on their own. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any other questions right now, but we will pause. Uh, please feel free to put them into the Q&A box for you serious hand feet. Sure. Before I could get to my spiel. Uh, have the requirements for MPO changed day of the surgery? I'm sorry, have the requirements for NPO changed? Yeah. Dave, they have to a degree. Um, patients are, should not eat uh, solid food uh, for about eight hours ahead. Usually you tell people after midnight, don't, uh, don't eat anything. But they can drink clear liquids up to two hours ahead of time, uh, including coffee or caffeine. Many patients uh, who drink a lot of caffeine uh, wake up and they haven't had a lot of caffeine and then they really have terrible headaches post-op. And sometimes the anesthesiology folks will give them IV caffeine, um, occasionally anyway. But uh, basically it's still no solid food for generally about eight hours and uh, clear liquids up to two hours uh, prior. So and that's prior to going to the hospital. And that, uh, so, you know, if you're supposed to check in to the hospital, at, we'll just say six in the morning, you're going to be a first case. You're not going to be in the OR probably until around eight. So there's another two hours in there that the clear liquids can be cleared. And again, I'll just remind you that the uh, people on the glucagon uh, agonists uh, should not take those the day of surgery or if it's injected the week of surgery because they have delayed gastric emptying. Wonderful, thank you. While we wait for more questions, um, I'm going to put in the chat, it is a link to the annual provider survey. If you are a provider and you haven't completed this survey, we would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, good, bad, ugly, just your year of experiencing uh, major projects. This really helps us plan for the next year and to, to make things better. Also a reminder, when you close out of this webinar, um, you will also have your CME survey. Uh, not only do you get CME credit for that, but we do share the feedback with our volunteer presenters, speakers. I apologize if you can hear my dog now in the background. <laughs> she, she likes to participate. All right, I don't see any questions. So thank you all for joining us today, Dr. Lore. Thank you as always, this was fantastic. Thank you. Thanks uh, to all of you for uh, giving me a little bit of your time. I hope this has been helpful for you. All right, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.